morning, everybody. From me, from Switzerland, um, from Joel, from Portugal. Hello and welcome. To Hello, this everybody. Hi. Um, that's the second webinar of a triple series, uh, all about immediate placement and immediate loading with Joel Tellers from Portugal. Um, my name is Holger Kast. I'm leading you through this webinar. I am doing moder uh, moderate this webinar. Um, it's a really great session that we're doing here. At the first time we had immediate placement, immediate loading uh, from single crown to, to aesthetic zones. And now we're going into the world of full arch uh, restorations, uh, all on four. We at TRI, we call it the, um, all on TRI. And um, Joel is going to show us an amazing presentation about that. And, and on the 15th of April, we're going to have our last session and therefore we, all, we need all your um, 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 help because we would like to, to get use this chance that you um, share your um, um, ideas of a case or your, your x-rays or maybe your experience with us, with um, Joel and me. And therefore, please uh, use the chance and write to academy at triimplants.com uh, your, your, your cases and we're going to, to, to share them next week um, with Joel. That's not the only thing. Joel is going to show a lot of things um, um, which is interesting as well. But I think we would like to do that more interactive. And so please use this chance and send us your um, uh, cases. Okay. So uh, today, as I already mentioned, it's all about all on four techniques. So therefore you need an implant system which offers you multi-unit abutments. And here on this um, uh, slide, you can see our straight multi-unit abutments, which we offer in different gingiva heights and our angulated multi-unit abutment, which is very unique because it's out, made out of one piece. So it's super stable, uh, 30 degree, degrees angulated. And the top design, as you can see here, is for both the same. And for those of you who know the TRI implant system, we have a tissue level, a bone level, and a narrow implant system. And for all these three different implant types, we have the same design, the same top design. That means what comes on top, like the TTA, the temporary abutments, the, um, the tie base on top of multi-unit abutments, all the things, the impression posts, and all those things are the same. So that shows, um, again, the simplicity of our implant system. And because Joel is going to show uh, a lot of things about the prosthetic creating, immediate prosthetic creating of um, um, full art restorations, I would like to take the chance to show you quickly this TTA um, abutment, which is not only a temporary abutment on top of multi-unit, it's also a tie base on top of multi-unit abutment. So you can use it in a conventional way, which is maybe in the, in the time of uh, doing your your full arch restoration and it's also as you can see in four different design heights you can cut it manually and also virtually we have it because TRI offers an open interface for all digital um, workflows and so in the software you can use this tie base or this, uh, temp, this TTA abutment um, to add a tie base on top of multi-unit. This is very special for, for example, for, multi, uh, for monolithic works. We designed it here. You can see there's a flat white base. So uh, if you have a full arch monolithic, you can, you can um, um, bond it to this tie base very secured and you don't have any problems with chipping and so on. So before I pass the word to, to uh, Joel, I would uh, I, I just show you quickly these four different design heights, but then there's something very special to say. Um, I would like to say happy birthday to Joel because it's his uh, birthday today. Happy birthday, my friend. Thank uh, you, man. Thank you. Happy <laughs> <laughs> in this team, uh, Joel, happy birthday to Portugal. And I think uh, on you. a birthday, you get a cake, and I think you should blow this candle and wish. <laughs> I will. <laughs> it's yeah. virtually, it worked. <laughs> it's a okay. virtual world now. <laughs> I'm going to share your screen and um, good Thank luck. You yeah. this, Thank you for this, Olga. Thank you for this. Nice pictures there. <laughs> Okay, now you should share your screen. Okay. 
I guess that you can see my screen now. Is it working? Um, yes, it is perfect. Oh. Uh, okay. Wait a second. Yeah, it's working. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about full arch uh, immediate loading. Um, I'm not going to waste too much time presenting myself again because we did this the, the last webinar a week ago. And just a reminder that uh, I work from a, a place in Pies da Regua, a very small city in Portugal that is the center of Douro wine region. Uh, and and uh, it's the capital of that region and it's the first, the market region of the world for wine. It's a beautiful place that you should all meet. And this is something that I, I really much like to tell people because it's true. It's uh, vineyards all around you. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place to, to, to see. Um, so let's dive into what brought us here today. Again, thank you, Olger, for the invitation. Thank you. You're Gira. welcome. Joel, I just uh, forgot one important thing. This webinar yes. also should be very interactive and we have all, all, already more than 200 people listening here. Mm -hmm. On the right side on the toolbar you have, you have a questions field. So in this questions field you can, you can write all your questions and during the webinar I try to, to moderate a lot of these questions to Joel through the webinar where the questions we don't can we can't answer to this time we're going to answer on the 15th uh, of the, our last webinar so use these tools on the right side and we we try to keep this thing very interactive here so sorry <clears throat> no no welcome so first of all let's understand why this is a big topic uh, and this this data, data here is very interesting that you see that there are more than 275 million people that suffer from severe tooth loss and this is increasing in between 2005 and 2015 almost 30 percent of increase 27 percent so and this leads to many many uh, uh, psychological and physical uh, uh, reflex on people that are, are without teeth low self-esteem and really sometimes it leads to real depression uh, so it's it's an important thing. Decreased chewing efficiency. Just a number so you understand. A normal guy can have right about 200 psi of bite force. If you have somebody that's using total dentures for more than 15 years, it can be reduced from 200 to six. So it's a major thing. It's not a small thing. Um, they, it can lead to dysphagia, and it says moderate. Sometimes not that moderate uh, articulation and speech disorders loss of facial support, the muscles all go numb, uh, and alveolar and basal bone jaw atrophy. So this is very important that you understand all these physical changes, but also the psychological ones. And that for me is my main goal, is trying to give something to people that helps them to get better with themselves, higher their self-esteem, make them feel better about themselves. themselves. So this Moriguchi study showed us that if you have all your teeth, of course, you have 100% chewing ability. If you lose one, it goes down for 70%. So immediately losing one teeth, you lose 30% of your chewing ability. Now, if you do a normal removable denture, it grows up again to 90. So, okay. But if you have a total prosthesis, it's 25. Okay. So it has a big impact in people's lives and, and this is something that you should keep in mind therefore we should try to move from removable to implant supported prosthesis and with all the advantages that come with it okay so i'm not going to go through all of these you all know this but it's very important that you understand that you are helping people in a physical way with all of this and especially in a psychological way uh, people avoid social contact, people avoid going to restaurants, people don't know what it's, it is to, to eat a steak anymore or to bite an apple. And this in their minds, is it's, it's always present. They're talking to somebody and they're afraid it will move, that it will come out of their mouth. So it's very important that we understand this and have the, 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 the goal to, uh, to make it uh, better for them. Now, what type of prosthesis are we talking about? So this is a, a classification that I'm sure you all know from Carl Misch. And 
regarding today we're going only going to talk about immediate loading so fixed about fp1 fp2 and fp3 and i tell you now that fp2 in full arch is not no longer an option for me i don't do it anymore for many years now mainly i do fp3 okay and sometimes fp1 fp1 there's a small amount of patients that are electable to do it this way in my opinion what we it's now called a mucogingival approach i love to do it but I select very carefully my patients. There are a lot of, of criteria that need to be filled in order for me to, to consider this an option. So what we try here is from a flat surface to recreate what's lost. And for that, normally I'll go using a guide like you see here that makes me understand where I want my teeth to be and the positioning of the papilla and everything where I want it to be. So from this situation, we try to move for this situation where papilla is growing, the tissue is getting attached, the anatomy is being regained. But this is for another webinar because it's too much information, but it's a low percentage of our patients that can be elected to, to, to go in this path. The major percentage of them are elected for FP3 and that's what we are going to discuss today. So regarding the surgery techniques itself, again, it all started with brain mark, and in, in his original protocol, uh, the implants were in an upright uh, positioning, center on the bone, and completely surrounded by bone, so center on the crest. Now, this immediately makes us think that this was only possible, uh, if you look to this uh, coward and owl classification, until class three. Four, five, and six were not electable for this. For this, yet another approach that we're not discussing here today. So his original protocol was a very long protocol uh, when time is concerned because you had to extract, then wait to six to eight months, then in the second stage, place the implants, leave them to be three to six months for osteointegration period, free stress, free of stress, and then you will enter the, the, the rehabilitation part. So it was a very, very long process. Um, and in the time, they already knew that it does not seem to make a difference if you use six or eight or even four or five implants. But the tendency was to use as many as possible. Now, this guy, this guy came along and he re revolutionized uh, <laughs> the dentistry of uh, the, the world dentistry uh, uh, regarding full arch. First of all, with this all on four technique. So, the advantage of this technique is that you maximize the, uh, the, all the, the, the use of all the bone that is, you still have available, all the remnant bone. Uh, so for atrophic jaws, this is very valid and important technique. So it allows you to uh, avoid uh, regenerative procedures, which will increase uh, treatment costs, patient morbidity, and complications inherent to this procedure itself. But by doing this all on four, the first one he did, I think it was in 1993, in one of his relatives in lower jaw. And then as he tried to move to the upper jaw, it started failing. <laughs> okay, So it was a success on the lower jaw, but not in the, in the upper jaw. It took him from, uh, it started doing lower jaw massively and trying to understand things in 98, and it was published five years later, and upper jaw in 99 and published uh, five years later again. So the, the objective of this technique is that you place two implants vertically on the anterior zone and then two angled on the posterior zone. In a maxilla, the distal implants are tilted anterior to the, maxima, uh, the maxillary antrum, and in the mandible, they are positioned tilt anterior to the mental foramen. And the inclination is in between 30 to 45 degrees. Therefore, you need multi-units that Olga discussed uh, to create more parallel outcomes for, for the screws itself. Um, and easier the passivity of course uh, so this technique allows for higher longer i mean longer implants therefore higher big it allows us for bicorticalization therefore higher primal stability as they are inclined the cantilever goes shorter because the head of your implant is more uh, on the back of, of your patient's mouth so it's a very clever technique that we can use and it's so many years now uh, working 
that you you there's no reason to to be afraid of doing an analog for and remember this is a technique made specifically for immediate loadings okay now the next thing you needed to do is create what you call the mallow bridge uh, because what was the bridges back then with the, the crown cemented was not working with 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 all on four so for that we have different solutions now that we'll discuss further in the presentation okay now let's start with the cases i brought you two cases okay i thought uh, yes sir. we have the first question uh, from a doctor from switzerland venazioni is his name why did the uh, aperture fail in the beginning because That's they didn't have the, yeah they didn't have the proper implants okay that's when Malo started developing uh, in conjunction with noble noble uh, um, gave him a chance to prove his point and they start develop the implant uh, spe specifically for all and for treatments um because back in the days implants were conical they were they were um how to say more parallel they were not conical, conical enough the connection was not good so they have several problems that the industry need to keep up in order to get better results that's that's why it was failing and of course the anatomy of the bone is very different upper jaw and lower jaw so that's why it's much more softer bone and you need torque to be able to do an immediate loading all on four procedure so it was failing so i'll take you through a case from beginning to ending and in the middle you might see some pictures not from that case to highlight some points okay because there were pictures I thought it would better for highlighting something. But from beginning to end, almost all you're going to see is from one case. I think this is the better way to try to make you understand my thoughts about these types of, of approaches. And in the very end, I'll take you to a trip to a really uh, um, tough case. Uh, but it's like a sighting of where you can go once you start understanding the all on four treatment. So the first thing you do, of course, is you collect data from your patient. Be very careful about the health conditions. Uh, be very careful about vitamin D. It's very important for our bone ability to, 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 um, to heal. Uh, be careful about medication. Remember bifosphonates. Be careful with them. So take a look at your patient health. Spend a little time talking with your patient. Do some casts, some panoramic x-ray, and some CBCT. Okay, this is the data you need to collect. But these health conditions are very, very important. So be, be, be wise of that. Then comes surgery planning. And for this, this is the combination of these two things that lead to the surgery planning. It's about the provisional prothesis that you are now uh, making with your patient, understanding what is the right positioning for your teeth, what is the right DVO, where you want the tip of your incisors to be. Okay, all of this combined with, with the CBCT is what leads you to, get, to understand what type of approach you're having. And sometimes you get a case that turns a bone, but you tell your patient, smile. And as he smiles, he shows all his, his, his gum. So you immediately, you know that you are going to reduce a lot of bone because you need to hide transition line, transition line and they have sp uh, prothetical space. So it's the combination of these two things that allows you to have good results. And this is the main thing for me that I still see people failing is because they, they forget the, the importance of this uh, uh, being a, a prosthetic orientated treatment. It all begins and ends with this. It does not begin and end with bone or a CBCT of that available bone. After this, and you're sure you, what you can do, you discuss the treatment options and of course the costs with your patient. Everything needs to be discussed. The swelling they're about to, to feel, because some of them do swell, uh, almost it's, it's not, normally it's pain, pain free. They don't get any pain, most of them. But you should tell them everything, what they can bite afterwards and what they cannot bite in the healing period. Everything should be, the material you're going to use on the final restoration, also very important. Everything should be explained in advance. So after everything is set, you, you, you continue with your provisional prothesis making off. You need to be your prothesis ready for the surgery day. And I'll explain why in a little bit. And then, of course, one there's question. the... One question yes? regarding the vitamin D uh, from Francisco Rocha. 
uh, if there's article about the osteo integration and the vitamin D and um, yeah, how um, about what about article about vitamin D uh, situation of the patient and the, the osteo integration. What you said before, you said the vitamin D. You said the vitamin D. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. For sure, yes. It it has it has to do with. Uh, it's for me. It's a little bit not. It's not so easy to to say this in English. It has to do with uh, the the uh, recaptation of uh, calcium. Okay, so your bone does not heal properly. If you have a patient with insufficient or deficiency of vitamin D, which which may lead to a, a grow of parathormone, uh, your bone healing capacity is way way decreased. So you sh you should check that. Of course you should. Some of our failures that we don't do the the exam for our patients has to do with this, especially in ladies, especially in ladies over 50, that they should be taking a vitamin D. Uh, uh, supplements they aren't, and this leads to complications on implants. That's uh, a known fact. Okay. So you discuss pre-op and post-op cares and the medication, uh, because normally they start antibiotic three days in advance. They they do the mouthwash with chlorhexidine three days in advance as well. They keep the medication for a certain period of time. All of these need to be discussed. The prescription should have been made. So everything is ready and without doubt for surgery day, okay? So this is the timeline that I normally follow. So this is the extra oral pictures of the case that we are seeing today, okay? And this is the provisional prothesis making of until I get to a point that I know where my teeth are going to be placed. So, once I know where my teeth are going to be placed, I need to transfer that for my what I call the virtual surgery for my CBCT. One small trick that you can use is that you measure from the top of your teeth to the, you measure more or less 15 millimeters that you know you're going to need for prothetical space and you draw a line with composite in a provisional prosthesis and you go for the CBCT with this. What you'll get in the end is a line where that composite line is and it will translate here in the line on the CBCT that you can see. Therefore, you know what amount of bone you need to cut. Okay, this is an easy way of doing this. Uh, but once you're planning, like you see here, you can plan the exact amount of bone that you are going to cut. You can plan the exact positioning of your implants, like you can see here. So you're basically doing the surgery, but virtually. Now, the bone reduction that you see here is this case is not much because you can see on the smile of the patient the smile line is not a concern hiding that smile line is not a concern is this this is what you want is to create space for your prosthesis to go in and depending on the material it can be higher or lower this this uh, this prosthetical space but you should think right about uh, 15 millimeters <clears throat> so this is the notions that we need to, to have and to understand when we're planning such a surgery. In lower jaw, it's basically the same thing. So you go through all of this, you see this measure here is why I chose to go for an all on four because it's, it was not wide, uh, long enough. So I had to use very short implants, six millimeter implants, and I didn't, I didn't think they're too good for full arch approaches. So I'll go with an all on four. One thing about all on four that I particularly like is that the the implants heads are very well apart for each other, allowing for better cleaning. Okay, so for maintenance and follow up, that's a big thing, and it's easier for the patients to keep them clean. So you've done your surgery, you know all your landmarks, you've done this, so it's like now it's like a second time. You know everything about this patient, you know where you're going to position your implants, and now you go for the real thing, you go for the surgery. Now, the first thing I would like to tell you <clears throat> is that, yes? One question, uh, antibiotic three days before surgery, question mark? Yes, always, okay. start in advance, yeah. It depends on the situation, if there's something that I'm more concerned about it, I may start five days in advance, but normal situation, three days. Yes. 
Now, one thing that I learned over the years, and I've been doing full art approaches for like 30, 14 years now, and all on four, my first one was more than 10 years ago. And one thing that really have a big impact on long-term results is where you do your incisions. So before you start, be very careful where to do your incisions. Don't go to vestibulary, go more or less like here. Leave keratinized tissue to be around the neck of your abutments. And especially in lower jaws, such as you see here, it's almost completely flat. There are some tricks that you need to understand to do an all on four, and I will try to highlight some of those. So uh, regarding incision and flap, this is a full thickness flap. And people seem to think otherwise, but the full thickness flap is sometimes more difficult than a, a, a partial thickness flap. And it, when you're dealing with wrist of jaws, and you'll see that further on the presentation, your uh, flap needs to be really careful. Where you put your blade needs to be very, very well thought of and very careful, because otherwise you may, you may end up damaging your tissue uh, cutting your tissue and therefore have a be a better, uh, worse healing results. The, the thing I would like to highlight is just these two cross incisions here. This is where I start to detach my flap, always from the bottom. And they need to be crossed, not the V. They need to be like this. So crossed incisions that allows us for better, better healing. It's easier for the, the, the blood, uh, the, the blood, cir blood circulation to regain itself again. So you don't, you don't get necrosis on the tips. It's way better to do it like this. And you start detaching. And I'll go from this part to here, and then from this part to here. One thing you can do at this moment, as you have your provisional ready, if you are not sure, still you're, you're, you're in the beginning of doing all on four, and you are not sure exactly if you transpose everything right to the CBCT, one thing you can do before you detach the palatal part is that you can put the provisional in place and measure again, so that you know it allows you to understand the where the the bone should be should be placed, where the the cutting the shelf should be created. Okay, understand? Put the prosthesis in, measure, and do some marks. That's it, and then you do the the you you go on with the surgery. So we, you do the the palatal flap again, and you get to this situation where everything is out of the way. As you can see in the picture, nothing is holding nothing and the bone is uh, at sight for you. So this for me is very important so that you, you, your mind is only focusing on the right orientation of your implants. Everything is out of the way and your both hands are free and your assistant as well. So how do you get to this? Some details. You, you tight your palatal flap like this with a silk sutcher, 406 sutcher. So you go inside from this part, and then you go outside in, come back here again, and in this part you go inside out again, and outside in, and it leads us to this situation here. It's a very important tip uh, that takes everything out of the way. And in the vestibular side, what I use is gauze with saline water that allows for two things. One, to keep detaching and not harming the tissue, and the other is to keep the tissue moist all throughout the surgery, which is very important, again, for healing. Like I told you in the last webinar, always keep your tissues moist, irrigated with saline water is very important. So therefore, the next step is the osteotomy. And now you know where the line is. It's perfectly clear in your head. You draw it on your bone. Do some drawing. Therefore, you, are, you, you don't lose track of space. For me, it's very important during surgery, and if in, sometimes you insert something occurs that you are that that cause some stress to you, you find something in the bone that you hadn't seen, some tooth that you need to extract doesn't come out properly. Things happen during surgery. The less you have on your mind, the better. That's why I like to clean everything, take everything out of the way, so it's no longer in the in the equation, and I draw what I need to do in the bone, so space and 3D positioning is no longer on my head again. The less on your head, the better you stay more focused. So you have the, your, line, your line draw there on the bone, so it's time for your bone reduction. Remember, not all the cases need bone reduction, but in all on four, all the cases need 
to be a shelf created. So they need to have a, 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 an osteotomy. If there is too much bone reduction or not, it depends on the case. In this scenario, it was three millimeters more or less, 3.2, so not big. What this again allows you <clears throat> is to create the prothetical space to hide the 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 smile line needs to be the transition line needs to be hidden in the smile line above the smile line um, and this is what your aim is again you need to think that the process that you selected needs to fit there and the point of your incision needs to be in the place that your your study doing that provisional uh, process is making of so more or less again more or less 15 millimeters of space one thing about this shelf that you are creating, even though you could not see that perfectly in that image, but you will see it further in the presentation with the same case, it's not flat. It's a little bit like this. It's a little bit tilted. And the, in the lower jaw, it's not flat again. It's a little bit tilted like this, okay? So what's the objective of this? Is that your prosthesis got a better design. It's easier to clean. You need to think this is a prosthetic orientated treatment. So your prosthesis needs to fit fixed like this and fixed like this okay not flat okay afterwards yes um good question um from tina star uh, what is the with what do you paint on the on the bone what do you use with what graphite ikea pencils <laughs> yeah, a pencil just sterilize the pencil it can go to the autoclave and you use it Whatever pencil you have, there's one from TRI, There's one for TRI. They're good. They're good pencils. <laughs> now you can sell pencils. <laughs> I know that uh, some some doctors uh, go to IKEA and they take the short ones. You can yeah, sell. Them. Yeah, there's not IKEA next where I live, but if they were, I will steal them. <laughs> yeah. And um, then there's a the next question from Salman Ali. What is your uh, recommendation for thin flap refraction? For what? Thin flap refraction. I, I we will I, get yeah yeah i understand yeah, about yeah. Uh, when the when the the crest is so thin that you need to to go to the and you you do the full thickness flap in in tissues not so good we'll get there okay uh the mm -hmm. the, the next case is a case such as this so we'll get there okay and but one last question before i leave you alone again um there's one question from switzerland how do you design and how much bone do you reduce? Um, and I think this is now what you're coming with the uh, uh, rule of, of the height. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so the next the next step for me is highly important and, and it gets neglected all the time, which is curettage. You need, after you've done the bone reduction and I do it normally with a prosthetical burr with the, the black ring, it's a mess, bone everywhere. Okay, so you need to clean everything before you start to 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 place your implants. Otherwise, you may be once you're drilling, creating the sockets, you may be putting something in there that leads to worse results. So clean everything, and immediately you can see that you got a D4 bone here. It's way it's very easy to understand this. So again, the bicorticalization that help with the shelf again. Sometimes it's too high. You need to create a shelf in order to get. Uh, Bicorticalization. Remember, in the right 16 millimeters is your uh, longer implant, and you, all of these needs to be in your head. Or all of these needs to be in the equation, so you don't miss it. In a normal four, there's no second chance. You need to place all your four implants in the right positioning with primal stability, with higher torques, in order to go for the full arch for the the immediate loading procedure. So, in this situation, I use the same Luca Caretz I told you last time about. I use the same. The big ones, and if I have sockets, alveolons, uh, 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 tooth that I just extracted, I use the smaller ones and uh, clean everything. So after this, it's implant placement. Normally, I'll go posterior first and then anterior. Now, the the all on four techniques tells us that sometimes it's useful to draw some some all on the sinus to get a feeling where the uh, uh, more anterior wall is, and you place your implant. Uh, on, on front of it. I don't do that anymore. I did it in the past. Now I don't. It's a useful tip. And if you're starting, maybe it's important that you drew a hole there, check where the sinus wall, anterior wall is, and put your, your, your implant and tilted anterior to that wall. Nowadays, I'll just, uh, I have my landmarks. I know where I'm going to do it. And I'll, I'll puncture with the lens drill. I take an x-ray. And for that, I 
followed my surgery. So I, I know if I have to go two millimeters further, if I'm the right spot, if I can go behind, I'll do it like this. So I don't puncture the, the sinus anymore. So this leads to this situation. And from here, you went for this. Now, what I would like to, to highlight in this, in this case is this. So if you see, it's an almost perfect correlation in between what you planned uh, uh, on, on, the, on the CBCT scan, your virtual surgery, and your actual surgery. And the main goal is to get this shape of polygonum because of the distribution of force. That's it's the mechanical part of things and why all and four work uh, and works for so many years now. Uh, so if you've do, done everything right, this should be like almost a coincident image in be between the CBCT that you've done and the actual surgery itself. Now the thing that I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not doing guided surgery um, for these cases. I'm, normally do it for FP1 cases. And this has to do with the thing that sometimes during surgery, there's things that you can see that you didn't see on the CBCT. And therefore, the, 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 the plate that you have done for the, for the guided surgery no longer is useful. So I prefer to see the bone. In this particular case that you see here, this picture is one of those cases. The input was supposed to be here, but the bone here, and once you start to clean it, it was completely rubbish, and I didn't want to use that bone, so I moved my implant further. Like I told you, in an all on four, there's no uh, second chance. The implants need to have higher torques. If the implant doesn't have higher torque, you need to, to have uh, a different approach because uh, all of the four need to, to have higher, higher torque and higher prime stability. In this image here, when I'm selecting the multi-units, you can see what I talked about, about the shelf being angulated. It's not flat. It's like this. Okay? Uh, sorry, like this. I was looking at the image and making the wrong movement. See here? It's like this in the upper jaw. Important for the, the prosthesis design. So Olga already discussed this, so you have these different heights of multi-units. I almost never ever use one millimeter. This is the aim, two millimeters combined with the, the part of the implant that that is uh, um, without threats. It's a good height for tissue, so I normally go for this one. Yes? Quick question, um, because uh, there was uh, quite a lot of questions uh, during surgery and bone reduction and so on. We can't answer all those. Um, we will have, a, at the end, we will have a question on the session, and we have the 15th, where we uh, combine all the questions a little bit more detailed and go a little bit more detailed on the 15th. But there was one question from Chua Fernandez. Why you plan your surgery on CPCT and don't go go do, do guided surgery? So so maybe I, I, I think I think I already explained this a little bit. Yeah. Because normally I, it would be helpful and you can ask your, your your lab to do a guide for the bone reduction. For the implant placement itself I really like to see the bone. I really like to see where, where I'm drilling. I, I really like to, to watch things. I, for me, it's, I don't like guided surgery for this type of approach that, all that much, for these type of approaches. If it's a different approach, like an FP1, guided surgery is very useful. But for this, I prefer to look at the bone, the conditions, and choose the right positioning. Sometimes, and you will see that, I'm sure you will see that in the, in the following case, you have really no second chance. You have one shot. You missed it, you missed the whole case. And you will very clearly see what I'm talking about in the next case, okay? So regarding, uh, uh, and I, Allah <laughs> Joao, I know that guy, I know who asked the question. Uh, and regarding, uh, and regarding these, these multi-unit uh, selection, uh, I avoid 70 degrees, I almost never use them. Um, except in a particular situation that you are also going to see, uh, I always go for 30 degrees inclination. They're very good. This this multi unit with one one piece. And then comes the third. Nothing be here. Single points all the way around, and sometimes double singles around our abutments to hold the tissue in place. One small tip. Sometimes it can be useful. Do it like this. So you do your searcher here on the buckle side and you 
do uh, with your scissors, tissue scissors, you grew like a cross there that goes over your, your abutment and stick the, the tissue in place. This is a tip that sometimes is very useful. And then comes the provisional process capture. Now you have it prepared and one small tip, I always do it uh, transparent on the palatal side. So I get to see if it is touching the palatal. Remember, you've done some bone reduction and sometimes it's a big bone reduction. So the flanks need to be really high so you can touch the nasal spine and all the palatal, that's the part that been untouched, needs to fit until the tuberosities. So you get a, a good feeling if it is in place. Small provisionals for this type of procedures are, in my opinion, a mistake that leads to missing the positioning in the end of the surgery. Uh, this turns into this. You, you draw the things you, you, where you need to, your holes to be. And once it goes to your patient mouth, you can feel it and you can see it touching the palatal all the way around. Okay, so this for me is important as well. Sometimes you don't have the time to do it. Your patient comes from abroad, uh, it doesn't live in Portugal, and you have to use what you have. So I use the removable process that they already have, but I don't particularly like this. Why? Because I need to introduce some changes that I think it's in the best way for the patient while making these new provisionals. And there are my first trial of the final restoration. So when I get to the final restoration, I'm no longer starting from the beginning. I'm adding information from my provisionals. Long-term provisionals are your best tool to understand if you did their DVO right, if the patient feels comfortable, if the tip of your incision is correct, you, the, your, your patient's mimic is regained over this healing period, and you get to see what you like of their smile, if the if there's some offset you like to do on the posterior region or not, what the buccal corridors look like. So it's very important for me to do the provisions. And then comes the provisional protein capture. I always isolate very well my surgery field, so nothing goes in there. And then comes this. I, I hope you get to see the video. I don't know if you get to see them or not, but the video is about showing you uh, that you have time. You wait for the acrylic to be in the sweet spot like this, not too moist, and you start putting it on, on the prothesis. And this is a slow process. You don't need to rush. You take your time, you put it there. I'm going forward a little bit more, as you can see. And the next thing is on the other side, keep pressing it, okay? So it won't get space without acrylic there. So from here on, you have time, and you go to the surgery room. There's Antonio Farage there and Francisco here, two of my greatest friends. And you have time. It's not a mess. It's not a complete mess. It's not. You remove the excess of acrylic. You expose your, your tie bases that you're using as provisionals. And you have time to slowly remove the leaf from this positioning, check everything. It's, a, 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 it, it's not a stress thing. And then you keep pressuring the, the acrylic. And in the end, with, with your probe, you puncture the holes so that you are always remembered to protect with cotton or wax from orthodontics that we are using now the cylinder, the, the buttons, so to remove the screws afterwards. But this is a process that you can take your time. And in the end, it's basically bite. Everything is set, you know the DVO, you're cool. So it's nothing too stressful that sometimes people have on their heads. And in the end, this is what you get. So you have your prosthesis, now it's fixed and it's time to take it off. So it's more or less four minutes, kind of. So we move it and you start reshaping it. This is where Francisco comes along again and he starts to reshape this prosthesis turning it into a, a fixed one. So it takes all these steps that we have no time to discuss, but this is very important that you understand all the concepts of a fixed denture is the same as the final one. And this is a, a provisional process prepared uh, after the surgery. Now, while he's doing this, I'm already doing anesthetic on the lower jaw and I'm starting lower jaw, okay? So this is a process that will take the lab uh, right about 45 minutes and the surgery itself is right about 45 minutes to an hour. So now 
if you if one hour and 30 to two hours you are ready to screw the the uh, upper jaw prosthesis in your patient's mouth look it's all very convex no concavities and the ring of of metal here exposed okay for better tissue stability so you start lower jaw the same kind of incision but be very careful um, that you, where you place your incision is crucial okay and in lower jaw it's even more cruel than upper jaw upper jaw it's a breeze lower jaw be very careful okay otherwise you'll be adding grafts of keratinized tissue in the ends okay so one small but very important thing always expose the mental nerves you absolutely have to because they're the ones that will guide you okay so you mark them and you do all these marks that you can see here this picture is not from this case but you can see the line so clearly that i i put it here you will go back to the case in the following images but i draw the midline where i want my lateral implants to be and this one and the other side, the same thing. I mark the nerve and I mark where I want the implant to be. So from here on, when I get to implant placement, it's just following the lines. I am no, no longer concerned about space, about where to place the implants. I double check the lines and I just follow them. So from here on, it's a breeze. And again, you can see that the shelf created is like this. Okay, very important. One other small tip, very important for lower jaw, countersink drill. You, you, if you don't do this, you'll end up in two situations that can be uh, complicated. One is that your implant doesn't got, the, does not go all the way down, and it's important for him to be, otherwise the mesial part will be outside of the bone. And the other thing is that you won't be able to fit your multi-unit in the end. And then you will be cutting bone with your implant already in place and praying that you don't touch it. Okay, so countersink drill in lower jaw is very important. Do you, because you just like said like fitting the multi-unit there was a question before um i forgot the name um about um how do you uh, positioning your 30 degrees angulated um, multi-unit uh, is it possible easily or uh, is there yes. any tip, tip to, to, to how you position the, the 30 degrees if the implant is no. 30 I'll tell that guy our story. I w at the beginning, I was messing with Holger and with Sandro, telling them that their multi-unit should have their positioning. You know, that tip that you hold your 30 degrees to go in place and then you screw in the other position. Um, so we discussed this a lot of times. And in the end, I had to, to say, okay, you guys are right. I was so used to using that and to know where uh, the screw of the protos is coming off that I, uh, I thought that was the better way. The, the thing with these guys multi units is, is that you can fit so perfectly and leave it to be and then screw it then one screw does not get on the head of the other and it's way easier so now it's a breeze for me to place these angled multi units uh, it was not like this uh, in the past but now it is because of the sense of feeling of grip and if you want to take your doubt about if it's the right screw positioning or not just pick up the impression copying a long screw put it in there and you can see where it's coming off so many questions fun. about tissue management one question was like uh, what do you do with the um, uh, um too much tissue after bone reduction do you cut it away or what are you doing with that it depends but sometimes yes sometimes yes sometimes yeah. i will reshape the tissue but more i uh, uh, it, the sutures, the double, double singles around the 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 the, the abutments is very important because they do the tissue like this, okay? They hold it in place if you do, do the double singles. So mm -hmm. you end up reducing less and less tissue dead in the past. And then there's the next uh, question from Sarah Samuel. Hi, Sarah. Uh, how will you manage the soft tissue to ensure a color of uh, keratinized tissue around the implants? after all the bone reduction it has to do where you place your incision line so if you place it carefully uh, you know me from our courses i normally tell okay go sushi because in the lower jaw where our, our main concern sometimes you really need to go sushi you really need to realize where the keratinized tissue still is and use what you have but you will see that in a minute okay you will see that i will get um, to that just a few slides 
Can you go just quickly back to the countersink um, um, drill? Because there was a question about uh, Aditya Ubagunta. Uh, sorry if I don't spell the name right. Um, um, he's asking what is a countersink. Just just show the countersink drill okay, quickly. Okay, 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 okay. okay. So a, a countersink drill was originally made that I know of. That I know of. I may be wrong. I don't. I'm not sure about this for tissue level implants. Um, so it, it cuts only the cortical parts. So this thing here doesn't cut nothing, and it's the same diameter of the, our pilot drill. And then this part here is the only part that cuts. It's to create a platform here that's uh, more or less the, the width of our implant. So it's allow for a passive in entering on the, the cortical side. And as the cortical on lower jaw is normally very thick, um, it's important to do this to have space for your multi-unit that goes behind because you got to remember the implant, the implant is inclined like this so this part is very deeper than this one so your multi-unit to get inside here this needs to be open that's what the countersink really is doing okay lots of questions popping in one last question uh, from eduardo santiago how do you know jo joel that uh, angulation of the, your posit uh, um, posterior implants do you just use uh, try to get between 30 and 45 degrees i think oh, it, it, oh eduardo i know that guy as well from a long time uh, yeah um, nowadays yes but you if you're not very well trained you can use the the, the noble guide the 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 malo guide you know that thing with the the screw in the middle and the angulations and the separation of of you can use it i've used it in the path nowadays i don't i i, I will draw i will play put my uh, patient in positioning i will expose the nerve and i will draw where i want my implant to be okay and it's not very difficult to understand 30 to 45 degrees and in lower jaw 30 is more than enough so i'll go to 45 to avoid cantilever, but I normally go to 30, 30 something degrees in lower jaw. In upper jaw, it's more important to me to have more proximal to 40 to 45 degrees. But nowadays, I don't use any type of guide, just drawing in the bone, everything in double second. After, after I take my time doing these drawings, after I'm sure it's all in positioning, just follow the lines. So for me, it's easier than to have a, a, a guide in the way of my surgery and moving around because it flips like this. So I don't I don't like all that much. I've used it in the past. I don't like it all that much, but it's a useful. So for some people, they they are very experienced and that they, they completely disagree with me. They still use it. So it's up to an individual choice, you know. <clears throat> so then comes multi-unit selection again. The same thing straight on the the upper jaw here the shelf is perfectly visible what i just explained to you and this picture again is not from this case let's go back to our case and here to understand that uh, it's parallel the way you select this is to get parallel outcome for your prosthesis to be able to to lay in a most uh, 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 parallel and uh, platform as possible flat flat platform as possible so back to our case and some small details regarding tissue. Sometimes this is so stiff and you can see, if you remember the beginning, this was almost flat. Look that I carefully detached all of this and I detached up to the momentum here to release all the muscular uh, um, uh, pressure that will be on your tissue. The other thing that to keep in mind, sometimes I do it, is that I will detach this point and then go uh, partial thickness flap and then detach it all. Why? So I don't have tension on my flap, on my vestibular flap in the end. And this in lower jaw is critical. If you don't do this, you'll end up, like I told you, adding grafts in the end because you will lose tissue. This midline incision here, sometimes I use it to better fit here and to better fit here. It's also very important. As you can see in the end, this is no longer making pressure around and the colors are looking good. This is also a small tip. Sometimes I'll do this in the lingual frying so that I will again release tension from this portion here because there was not too much keratinized tissue. You can see here that I tried to separate, like I told you, sushi technique, try to separate the keratinized tissue very, very carefully but there was not much to separate here. It was almost completely flat. 
there's a little bit here, a little bit there, but it's very, very thin because in total you had like two millimeters. So I keep like one and a half here and like 0 0.5 there. So release the tensions, it's very important. And then you go for your provisional capture. This time is way easier because you just have to put it in place and set bite and hold and that's it. It's way easier. Everything is preset for the, the upper jaw. The lower jaw is easier. And you go following the same rules. Again, the same thing. I'm not going to discuss this again. So it's the same procedure and you're ready to put it in place. And this is surgery day. And this is the lateral views of your provisionals in place okay so then you're ready your patient can go home i normally give them give them a list of what uh, what are the concerns they need to have how do they what the the, the cleaning that they should do um, everything is on a paper that i give to them with all the information including the diet that they need to be in Okay, what they can chew and not chew the first days, only cold things. After a few days, then they, can, they get a gradual diet of what they can chew. But this is, again, a longer topic. But everything is given to them in a paper they take home. And this is all explained, remember, ahead of the surgery, not on the day of the surgery. So one small tip, this is the immediate aesthetics of our case. And one thing you, you need to understand, these two lines here, are there for a reason they're they're there because i know that measurement of dvo and they're there because i can always do, throughout the surgery while i'm positioning i can measure again i can be sure if i'm doing things right or not so this is my first impressions of the case this is what i planned with our patient and i want to be as correct to that planning as possible now this is the post-op panoramic x-ray Okay, and you can see the beautiful distribution. You can see that the implants heads are separated from each other. You can see that to respect all the rules, then it, it looks good. Now let's see how it heals. And this is after three months. Normally in these cases, after three months, I start to do the final restoration. Now, in the upper jaw, tissue no, normally is not a big concern, but in the lower jaw, if you look closely, we go through this to this, and we went from one situation to the other without any type of graft, only thinking where to cut and how to do the proper suture to understand that this tissue, this keratinized tissue is vital for our long-term results. And throughout the cases uh, that I normally show on my courses, this is always a topic, this is always a concern. Think about tissue before you start cutting. Don't go obsessed with bone. There's ways of, of dealing with uh, poor bone density, poor bone quantity. There are techniques. Tissue is the thing, even in full arch approaches. Then we go to our final restoration. And I'm getting out of time, Olga. Um, I don't want to rush, but, but we're getting out of time. Uh, so first I do casts. And then the first protocol I have with my lab is the first appointment is for bite registration. Nothing too big here. Uh, you all know this, so I'm not going to waste too many time here. Always screw in all the implants, okay? Always screw in all of them, draw your lines. And one small tip that's very important, you have this on the articulator. So the DVO, you, have, you see two lines here. These two lines is because I know the exact measure for those with the provisionals in place. So I can know if I want to go with the same DVO, I'll go exactly with the same DVO. If I want to change something, had one millimeter, small, uh, lower one millimeter, I can do it precisely without a shadow of a doubt because these two lines here on the articulator. One small tip, very important. Now you have feedback for your patient for three months. Now you know what the, the, the what changes you want to do. Then in the same appointment, I do this passivity. So this I do with these two structures, these two milled aluminum bars that only serve the purpose to do passivity. So I do x-rays of every and single one implant, very well done, very parallel, and I send them to the lab. So now they know every positioning is perfect and our virtual model and our actual model are precise and everything is in place so we can go further in the case. For here on, there's no doubt, either we are passive or not. 
And this is one of the main reasons I don't splint my impression copying no more in full art approaches. One of the reasons. So the next appointment, diagnostic wax up. So this is what we get from the lab. We go to our patient's mouth. Normally I'll do a, a small video, but I don't check too much of occlusion. It's more of pink and white balance and the shape of our teeth. I do occlusion in this next appointment, which is the try-in. Okay, this is a, a structure that I can cut, that I can add, that I can subtract, I can do whatever I want to this structure, and it's the first uh, real feeling of what the final result is going to be. Sometimes I ask the lab to draw some red lines here so that I even get a better feeling of the, uh, the correlation in between pink aesthetic and uh, white aesthetic. And you can see the shape of the prothesis here, like I told you. Remember the shelf, okay? Easier to clean. And then we got to select. We, we have our, uh, the, the the alterations I made are again read with the with the scanner, with the bench scanner, and the final structure is begin to be constructed on the CAD. So here is once we get to select the height of multi units in the library that we're going to use. It depends here. You know, on this image here, if you want them to go higher, if you want them to go smaller, you can choose from all these different heights the perfect one. Remember, if it's too small, the cementation line regarding where your strength is on your teeth, you may end up with these cementations and therefore fractures if you're dealing with monolithics. So the, choose, uh, the choice of these uh, heights of abutments is vital for the success of monolithics. So from here on, what we get is this. Normally, in upper jaw, a monolithic with cutback for ceramics, it's only 0 0.5 millimeters of ceramic on the static zone. Sometimes in the posterior regions, we leave it exposed, the, the, the frame of monolithic. And this is where your, your technician needs to be very careful because it, it has to understand that to create uh, tra trans, uh, transparencies and uh, depth effect and all these pigments with ceramic to make it look beautiful in just 0 0.5 millimeters it takes an experienced technician okay it's not easy to do it's way easier if you have uh, a, a deeper uh, ceramic and in lower jaw uh, one thing important about uh, uh, about uh, monolithics you need to to let them cool very uh, uh, two to three hours the cooling needs to be uh, um, long uh, because every time you burn the ceramic uh, uh, because of the properties of heat of of uh, uh, heat in the in the monolithics they need to be cooled very smoothly and they do this four to five times okay uh, uh, before they can touch the ceramic okay if not you it will be weakening the structure itself and it may lead to failure and in the lower jaw we do in acrylic this t inverted shape is the best shape for retention of your acrylic. The adhesive they use is very, very important as well. And the the, the um, letting the the uh, thermopolymerization go cooler in six to eight hours, a long period, is also very important for the structure to be strong in in your acrylic. So all these considerations you need to understand in order to be able to to do these final restorations. And it leads you to the final result with eye aesthetics as your patients want and as you for sure want as well. And all the rest, all the touching parts are only stained, okay? This is all stained. The cutback is only in the parts where there is no force to it, there is no pressure, there is no contact whatsoever. And you don't touch this once you're placing it. You place it, you've done everything on the on the trying here it's not to be touched all your occlusion is already set so just to put it in place otherwise you'll be in trouble and this is the final x-rays of this particular case you can see everything in place with very small cantilevers due to the inclination of your implants and this is the final restoration of this gentleman here now remember the initial situation, we went from here to there in more or less four and a half months, okay? So this is a case from beginning to ending, and I hope I didn't bore you too much. 
But if you are sleepy now, it's time to wake. <laughs> right, Olga? It's time to wake. Um, what I'm about to tell you now, and that we don't have much time, so I'm going to be quick about this, but this is a reminder that if you if you have tools enough, if you understand the concepts of all on four, you can push the boundaries. But for these, you need to have a, a path behind you. You need to be very confident about what you're doing to offer solutions for some patients that they, they don't have easier way out. So this patient came to me from abroad. She lives in England. And she had this situation, a car accident when she was a teenager and she lost her teeth. So you can see the scarring here and you can see all the tissue is numb. It, it doesn't have uh, a tenacity to it. All the lip movements are numb um, because she does not have teeth for as long as she can remember. And she was having trouble to find somebody to accept her case because she, it was very dramatic and she didn't have money enough to go for a zygoma implants. That was what was proposed to her. So, yes? A uh, quick question because I know this is a, a very special case and there will come a lot of questions and um, uh, we, we, we have already overtaken an hour, but uh, I think this is important questions. Um, for the first uh, uh, question, Ken, uh, why did you choose a metal substructure framework in the uh, mandibula? I think this is a, a very important question. And, yeah. Why do I choose instead of what? I think of full monolithic and, and yeah, maybe that's... Uh, I, I, okay, okay. I, normally, I don't like to use monolithic against monolithics. Uh, I think they are too stiff uh, to go one against the other. I prefer to use one soft structure against the, the monolithic. That's my, uh, my preference. Um, it's not a scientific thing, it's just a preference of mine. I prefer to have one that is more uh, allowing uh, for for wear off, it's more uh, elastic, and the other one uh, with eye aesthetics and the uh, strength of the monolithics. And then that's, also the micro moving in the lower jaw, which which is yes, it it that depends a lot. Um, in that particular case, I was not too concerned about that because the the it was wide enough. If you're talking about jaws, uh, lower jaws that are too resolved, like you're going to see in this case, that's a thing. The, the, the flexion of the mandible, that, that's a thing. That's one of the main reasons that 90% of the times when in doubt, I go all on four. Because I realized back in the days that the more implants I was losing was the distal ones uh, because of that deflection. And then there's one more question just before we go into this case, in the last case, um, um, from beautiful Jordan. Hi, Ashraf, in this moment. Um, what is the minimum torque acceptable for inserting the implants in this technique and uh, doing a load? For me, 32. Okay, for me, 30. thank you. I, normally, I will always place them at 50. It's normally with your implants, it's very easy to do. There are some tricks to it as well that we can discuss in Q&A, but normally I'll go 50 all of the times. And the least I can accept is 32. Uh, there are some tricks as well for D4 bone, like you saw there. So there are a bunch of tricks that you can use that we, we can discuss them, but not, not here, not now, because we don't have the time. Um, <clears throat> but in the next, if you want, we can discuss that. So this patient, back to her, she was a heavy smoker and she was feeling really bad because she, she could not remember the last time she had the chance to bite something, to hit a fruit, to eat a sandwich, everything. She, she was a teenager when she lost her teeth. And you can see here the pattern of resorption is like this. This happens when you use removable for a long time. The pattern of resorption goes like this, okay? And this leads you to a problem because you can see the tissue there, okay? So you need to be careful. Now when you're planning, you immediately know, okay, I need to hide these things. I cannot leave them exposed or I'll have transition lines that can be seen in the patient's smile. You need to create space. This is the panoramic x-ray and immediately you can see the amount of resorption. Look at the width here and here and look here. Okay. Now take a look at the CBCT. And this is the cruel part of it. Because if you look at here, this is what you have to work. And this is why people were saying to her that she needed 
to do zygoma. Look here, how thin this is. And even though you get to look this and work on this, and it's the cruel thing is once you start the surgery, okay? Because you know that you are not going to find many. You know this is only one millimeter and something width. But once you start the surgery, that's the main thing. So this I only put here so to remind you that this is not from my head. Palatal approach is from 1999, and all on four shelf is from 2010. Torsten Matzen did this article in 99, and Jensen did this one in 2010. So the combination of these techniques is something very useful when you deal with situations such as this. Now, the first thing you need to be careful is that it's easier to miss this really, really thin crest with your scalp. So this incision, of course, takes me much more time than normal because I need to think that I need to find bone where my scalp is going is going in and again to detach all of this without damaging the tissue also is very important and i need really big flaps to expose the 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 nasal floor and uh, to do the nasal floor elevation i need very big flaps and normally i will empty the nerve here now and 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 all on four palatal approach is exactly what you see here now if you see the crest here is about one to two millimeters and the implants are 3.7. I don't go smaller than 3.7. And you can see they're completely exposed, all the four of them. Uh, and this does not get any type of graft. The literature shows you no difference in results if you graft or you don't graft. Now, this is a very cruel image. You can see the bone cracking once the implant is going in. And this is difficult, very difficult to do, I assure you. So you need this. I'm not showing you this so that people that are thinking about doing all on four start doing this right now. This is so that you understand once you uh, have a, a, a um, confidence in, in what you do and you are well trained, you can go into very resolved situations and solve them. Uh, so. This is has to do that you are placing implant only in cortical bone. So be very careful once you're placing the implant. And they're aiming for this piriform process here, right uh, distally to the nasal uh, floor to get anchorage, okay? This is a close-up of what you gain. And you can see here the crest. It's completely thin all the way. So this is the immediate aesthetics and you can see the swelling in the end of the surgery uh, because of the very, very big flaps that we've done. So this patient, like I told you, is from abroad. She went back to, 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 to England. Uh, she lives near Birmingham. Uh, and I didn't get to see her for 18 months. And so, Olga, you know this case from the beginning and you know that it was not the uh, uh, end of the story for 18 months. This is the post-op panoramic X-ray. And I'm going to show you this image is very, very cruel. It stuck on my head and I'm sure it will be stuck on yours. This is the final CBCT on the surgery day. And you can see perfectly here all the threads exposed and just touching this really thin crest. But you can see here that the, the buckle side of things is unarmed. And that is cru crucial. You don't have a plan B. You cannot fail here. You fail, you ruin the case and you'll end up with zygoma, <laughs> okay? Or now with bone easy from Rui Coelho. So after 18 months, when she finally came back to me for the final restorations, this is what we had immediately once I remove the, the provisionals. I remove the provisional, this is what you get. Look of the aspect of this tissue. Immediately, I was feeling very confident. So I ordered the CBCT. She went to the CBC. Ah, just a reminder from this situation that I'm sure all of you would be concerned. We moved to this situation. And if I showed you only this picture, probably none of you would be concerned about the case. You said, okay, it's perfect. It's good. It will work. So this is very common on uh, palatal approaches. Now let's took a, a look at the, the CBCT of 18 months and let's highlight this. Now look at the buckle bone and be in mind that 
less than one millimeter, you don't get to see on the CBCT. So in order to see this, this is two or more millimeters of buccal bone. And of course, in the cortical side, you have what you have. Look here, look here, and look here. If you look closely, you can see that the implant shape itself helped us here. Two things, that uh, uh, polished color is very helpful not to pressure the crest. That's why you get bone stability in this point. And as uh, the format of your implant itself being conical, helps to compress the bone in the right positioning, in the right parts, and help to reshape here. Look, it's reshaped the cortical. The bone handled the situation and healed around it. And for here, we went to the final restoration and you yeah. use the ac acrylic as final restoration in this case. The most frequent yes, question here is uh, clearly about uh, what what did you do with the um, palatinal side, the, the open side of the threads? And did you do nothing? Any? Nothing. Just trusting the periosteum. The literature is clear about it that it makes no difference. There's no need for grafting. Okay. There's a yeah. bunch of literature around that. You can read a very good article from Peña Rocha uh, that describes this. I can bring the article from the next section if you want. Uh, and you can follow Abilio Coped from Brazil. He has a tons of, of, of things about this. And Salomão has a ton of things about this as well. So this is, a, this is now 20 years, 21 years doing this, these techniques. So it's nothing new. Um, it's just it's not mainstream, OK? So we went from this situation to this situation. In this particular case, in more than 18 months, but due to the patient, not to the healing time itself. Um, but it's, it's a story that I, I, that I really like because she was feeling really hopeless, really hopeless. And she, she has a new life now. She has a new job. She has a new, really a new life after, after this procedure. So I really really like this, this this case this is not even and you Olga you know this the toughest you can go I have even more more uh, severe cases uh, than using combination of techniques and and even other ones I yes, think Olga. it's very important in this point to say that um, this this case is a case where the patient comes to Joel's place and there's no other way uh, to be with a fixed um, implant or prosthesis uh, using, regular, using regular implants, there's not. There's other options. There's other options. There's bone easy and there is uh, uh, um, zygoma implants, okay? But she, the costs for her were too high. The, the, the costs for this type of treatment is exactly the same for regular all and four. So ah. it's a, sh it's a then, cheapest uh, treatment. There's another question again about his 18 months. This is uh, from Dalit Kumar, and this is only because his patient was living in uh, the UK and she could she did not show up. She was already so happy with the um, yeah. with temporary that she didn't show up for 18 months. And uh, Joel was waiting, uh, and he told me every every month when we did the course. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually, Auger, you, 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 you. If you remember, you had a, a, an office in UK that would, was able to do the CBCT for her near M Birmingham because you wanted to see the result. Remember, <laughs> and you find someone that would was uh, kind enough to offer the CBCT, but then she called back and she she appeared for the final restoration, so it was no need. Okay, that's one last question, and then we have to continue to finalize. Um, uh, lovely result. So does Joel not do GBR for just uh, these all on four uh, plates ca exposed uh, cases? Or can I, I, don't, yeah, I okay. don't do GBR. The okay. full arch restorations in my mind, in my mind, if we're dealing with FP3, should avoid uh, uh, grafts. That's perfectly clear on my mind. Okay, uh, it's uh, much more cost efficient. It's uh, much more less morbidity for the patient, less procedures. But it also it all depends on the patient. I do GBR well, as well sometimes. In this case, how do you don't pressure, pressure bone and polished uh, surface of the implant? Questions by Francisco Roja. That's a very good question, Francisco. That's a very good question. It has to do with the technique of drilling. 
but it's uh, I can we can discuss that out in Q and A. It's too long a topic. I can explain how to approach this type of bond because th that's a very good question. You're only dealing with torque, and there is one thing that you should be very careful in these situations. If you exceed torque, and that's very easy to do, I assure you, in these cases, the buckle bone might break, and if it breaks now you're in a bad situation so you it's very tricky the way you do this this is a, a, like i told you this is a step that you need to to climb the stairs climb the stairs a step in each time to get to a situation that you are able to do something like this this is not easy to do this type of volatile approach but it's to prove a point that volatile approach is very very helpful in some situations you have reads of four to five millimeters i'll go palatal approach on those it's a slight palatal approach with i'll go i know i will have way better results than trying to approach the crest so if you understand the concept you'll be in better situations most of the times once you could have failed if you approach by crestally that's the objective of showing you this okay please okay? continue let's end so some key points to end this it's way too much time so you all are tired of listening to me so patient selection and orientation are very important and of course level the expectations of your patient they want natural teeth again and that i cannot do okay level the, the expectations very important it's always a prosthetic orientated surgery the planning has to do with the prosthesis, not with the bone the bone comes second then comes osteotomy. Don't be afraid of do the bone reduction you need to do. Remember, aid transition lines, create protective space, do that shelf, and buy cortical anchorage. This is why you need osteotomy. When in doubt, go palatal. You know that by now. The tissue management and provisional restoration. Think about the tissue. Think about the keratinized tissue. Go uh, partial thickness flap beside the line of the keratinized tissue if you need to release tension. This is something that you should have in your mind. Final restoration and material selection. We didn't get the time to talk about this, but this is very, very important. It's something that I spend a lot of time talking about in our courses that me and Olga do. And of course, maintenance and follow up protocols are also essential. And my last key point, and most important of all, and build yourself a team. This is something I spend tons of time during my course to discuss. This is Antonio Frage, the guy that does all the surgery with me, one of my closest friends. This is Maria do Carmo, one of my assistants. This is Paula. This is the two that always are with me, one or the other, during surgery times. This is Francisco, the guy that's uh, the, the technician that is closely working with me all throughout the surgery, that knows the provisions way better than I do, that does that, does that beautiful pieces of art. This is João Fernandes for DMT, the one that made the question back there, uh, the, is, is the guy from the dental milling technology, the, all the milling structures he's, uh, he's doing. And this is Sara, the responsible for all the beautiful crowns you saw in the first webinar on all this full uh, ceramic and monolithic restoration that you saw. She's very, very talented. Um, this is an ugly guy that I have the chance to work with. Uh, and the point is that you should make friendship and build relations with these people because in surgery room, in the stressful moments, that counts. You can depend on one another. So I leave you with this image from our trip that Olga and I did last year in the summer with our families and watching a beautiful sunset near Stubel. And that's it. Oh, and I hope you all can join our course. It had been a new date, of course, because of what we are all going through. Thank you so much, uh, Joel, for this uh, great webinar. Very super interesting webinar. Let me share quickly uh, my screen and continue here from your birthday to the question and answers. We will answer a few questions, um, but uh, don't forget um, uh, on the 15th, uh, we have another session. If you have, after this uh, amazing presentation, if you have questions to Joel, you can send them uh, to Tree Academy. Um, 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 I don't have the slide yet. I'll show you this uh, the, the email address quickly at the end. But um, if you are interested to have a course uh, with uh, Joel and, and me, 
uh, in Zurich, we're going to, we have to postpone the, due to the Corona situation right now, we have to postpone the course of June uh, to the November uh, 26th and 27th in Zurich. So we have a two days course there with hands-on and everything. We go much more into the details of this uh, all on TRI techniques here. And um, um, if you want to join us, there's some uh, places left. Um, but um, before I let you go, I would like to also introduce you quickly to the ne next generation of implants. That's uh, uh, the digital implant. It's called the Matrix, um, which are we developing from TRI since uh, more than two and a half years. We're working on the future of uh, dentistry and the digital dentistry and the digital workflows. And um, we're going to have a big digital festival, hopefully in September 25th, 26th, um, um, with all of you sign up for this West festival. Um, Joel will have a big presentation there as well. There's plenty of other uh, world-known um, speakers coming to Cascais in Portugal. And we have a two days festival. So we also hear uh, Joel playing music with his brother, who's a dentist as well. And they have a great band. And we, we, we have an uh, amazing uh, lineup. Let's say it, call it lineup in this moment with um, uh, great speakers from all around the world. And don't forget, and here you can see the uh, whole, uh, the, the email address where you can uh, send your questions to this webinar from, from, from today and also from last week at academy at tri minus implants dot swiss or dot com. Um, and please send your um, um, whatever you want to know for next time. We would like to do it a little bit more interactive. I think Joel is going to show another another cases. We pair, we, we cross through all the questions we couldn't answer during this uh, presentation now and uh, make a big answering session uh, next week. So that's from my side. Uh, Joel, is there anything you want to say? No, I just I like to remind everybody that it will be very interesting if they asked all the questions on this third session. I would not like to go making another presentation about anything. I would much more like to be precisely answering the questions, showing case that solves what's on your mind, the question that you have on your mind. So it will be very interesting to turn this into a very interactive thing. That's been our goal since the beginning of this series of webinars. So please share your cases, ask your questions, and let's make this into a profitable uh, discussion for all. Okay, so see you next week. Please um, don't forget we're going to week. going through your questions and going to answer them. And we have a copy of this video. Uh, we do a video of this uh, presentation, which we're going to send you out uh, for uh, in the next okay. day. So now I'll go drink. Now I'll go drink champagne. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.